Thanks, Deb, and thanks uh, for the invitation and the chance to speak to such a diverse and large audience on this topic. Um, <clears throat> I've been interested in this question of uh, creation of potential pandemic pathogens, which I'll define in a minute, for a couple of years, uh, starting with a, an undergraduate lecture I gave in, in a Harvard class a couple of years ago. Um, and when I gave the title, The Debate, uh, it's slightly disingenuous in the sense that I'm going to give you more of one side of the debate than the other. Um, and I think it's an important debate for scientists in all sorts of allied fields, uh, not just virology but uh, or epidemiology, but uh, all the fields around it within biology and beyond to, um, to think about. <clears throat> all of us, many of us who work with dangerous chemicals or dangerous pathogens uh, do so with the knowledge uh, that we are putting ourselves at some risk. Uh, in the service of doing good science, and our society funds and, and supports that work despite the risk to some, some people uh, because we see the benefits of science. And so uh, we make this sense, we, we come to the sense that there is a risk benefit balance between the risks, like the risk that led to the death of the researcher in San Francisco a couple of years ago working on a meningococcus from a laboratory acquired infection, uh, that such uh, or the deaths uh, in, in other settings uh, from chemical exposures. Um, we know that those happen and we know that that's, and we accept that um, because we think science has benefits. And the argument that I want to make in a nutshell today is that we have a new type of experimentation where the risks have grown to be not just to the individual investigators or to a few people around them, but the risk of generating a new pandemic of a, of a highly virulent infectious agent. And that the benefits of that uh, experimentation have not been well defended. And in my argument are essentially small compared appropriately to alternatives. And I'll say more of what that means. But I wanna start by the sort of disclaimer that I'm taking one of two easy positions to take. You can either say the risks are small and the benefits are large and then it's easy, or you can say the risks are large and the benefits are relatively small, which is the position I'm taking, and then the decision is, is pretty clear. You should evaluate what I say about risks and what I say about benefits independent of one another, and you may agree with me on one and disagree on the other, because they're independent questions, and I actually find comp complexity tantalizing and find it a little uncomfortable to have such a simple position, which is risks are big, benefits are small, we should stop. Um, so uh, that is my position and you'll see that throughout, but you should, you should think about each piece separately. So uh, in that same vein, these views are my own. They are not the, uh, they are the result of many conversations with colleagues, some of whom are listed here. They're certainly not necessarily the views of the NIH or par any part of it, uh, which is one of my, which is my major funder. Um, and uh, some of this, much of this material uh, in an earlier version is in a uh, paper in May in Plus Medicine. So the title is, is the debate over potential pandemic pathogens. That's a, a contentious term, exactly what it means or whether it's a good term to use, whether it's, uh, but what, I mean when I say potential pandemic pathogens uh, is, the, is the creation of a strain of virus, uh, basically, although it could be another pathogenic species, that is transmissible between humans, virulent in humans, and novel, meaning it's not currently found in human populations and there's not protective immunity against it in human populations. The kinds of experiments that triggered the current discussion uh, mostly, uh, almost exclusively have been with influenza virus. And the, the typical setup is to take a virus, uh, an influenza virus, do a combination of genetic engineering uh, on, the, on the RNA sequence of that virus and selection experiments in ferrets, usually, sometimes guinea pigs, in which the, the uh, virus is passaged from, one, from the nose of one guinea pig or, or uh, ferret to the next 
And then after several such passages, uh, it is allowed to move through airborne droplet transmission uh, from the cage of one ferret to another cage uh, via only airflow and no contact uh, in a setup like the one you see there. Throughout the process, these viruses are sequenced. Uh, they're usually quasi-species that come out of the genetically diverse viruses. Um, and so they're deep sequenced and they assay various phenotypes of these viruses. And then that's repeated to enhance the selective pressure and get more and more uh, transmissible viruses. And the, the work was started, the, the controversial work was started with H5N1 avian flu virus, which has about a 60% uh, case fatality ratio in uh, humans who have been diagnosed with it with the wild type. Um, so these are the two famous studies that were published in 2012. Um, and <clears throat> looking back, it is actually clear that a number of other studies before and, and now since have also uh, done this kind of work uh, to create a novel virulent transmissible strain. Um, and some of them are listed here. Um, notably, they include a, a variety of different viral subtypes, um, including ones that have been seen in humans and ones that have not been seen in humans. The ones that have been seen in humans justify uh, the studies in the discussion as if we have to understand whether they're going to become pandemic and the ones that haven't been seen in humans are justified as they haven't been in humans so we need to study them. So apparently you start with premise A or not A and you get to the conclusion we should do this study which is a lesson for all of us in grant writing. Um, the funders of these experiments to date uh, include uh, governments and the European Union and major foundations. Um, the US government and China have been the largest funders, I believe, at least in terms of amount of publications that I've been able to find. Um, the Gates Foundation uh, did this some early and has uh, at least some members, some high up people in the Gates Foundation have said this will not continue. And then on October 17th, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, a big event happened, which is that uh, the White House announced a pause on funding of these, of these experiments. And the statement was the US, new US government funding will not be released for gain of function research projects reasonably anticipated to confer attributes to influenza, MERS, or SARS viruses such that the viruses would be more pathogenic or transmit more readily by the respiratory route. And they specifically exclude characterization or testing of naturally occurring isolates, which I think is a very important exclusion. A good, good idea, um, because those are not nearly so dangerous. Uh, a little bit of a surprise was the inclusion of MERS and SARS viruses. Much of the controversy really had been around influenza, um, and uh, it was a little bit surprising to find MERS and SARS on this list, but it was. But they were. So I want to talk about the risks of such studies, the ethics of such, uh, of how to think about such risky studies. Um, the benefits and some alternatives and ways of evaluating alternatives um, or evaluating these experiments in comparison to alternatives. Um, so the, the evaluation of risks uh, came into sharp focus last summer when three incidents in government labs, uh, prominent government labs occurred. There was a, a ex potential exposure of several dozen CDC employees to anthrax due to an inadequate decontamination of a sample. As far as we know, no one was infected, uh, but many people were, were treated prophylactically uh, to prevent infection. There was a mix-up of a highly virulent flu strain with a less virulent flu strain uh, that was mailed out from the CDC. Um, and there was a uh, discovery of smallpox, and then it turns out quite a number of other pathogens sort of stuck in a freezer that no one had looked in for a long time uh, at an NIH FDA facility. This got policymakers' attention. It was actually not really big news if you had been following the, the pattern of experiment of, of accidents. Research comes with risk. Humans are involved. All three of those involve some sort of human error or forgetfulness. And in fact, if you look in the literature, there are papers reporting the rate at which uh, such mishaps occur, which is remarkably high. It's about twice a week with select agents alone in the United States. Um, twice a week 
uh, that, that something reportable with the select agent happens, a loss event or a, uh, or a um, ex potential exposure. The number of actual infections is much less, but still uh, calculable, and that's the first piece of the, the input into the risks that I'll talk about. So, as you know, politics focuses on stories. It doesn't usually focus on statistics, and this got everyone's attention. Uh, those of us who have been concerned about it tried to use that, those events to get people's attention by writing articles uh, and, and making fusses. But this is not a one-off story. This was an example of the sort of routine fact that even the best labs make mistakes. And that's something we can usually accept and sometimes shouldn't. So <clears throat> the category of creating potential pandemic pathogens or novel strains of influenza to me is a uniquely dangerous and risky activity compared to some of the other risky activities that we do and should be doing in labs. So I've compared here four different types of activities. Uh, work on Ebola virus, for example, um, in, la in laboratories. That virus, as you know, has high virulence. Uh, we hope that, the, that we can still say it does not have pandemic potential in the sense of global effective global spread, and I think if it, if it escaped from a laboratory in a developed country, it probably would not be the source of global spread. Hopefully nothing will be. Um, but certainly uh, it has not been considered something that's capable of spreading widely in, uh, in the developed part of the world. And it exists in nature, and so there's an argument that putting it in a high containment lab is uh, not in any sense making it more dangerous than having it out there uh, infecting people. Nonetheless, because it's so virulent, we do it in BSL biosafety level four. If you go to the next uh, category, which is the characterization of natural highly virulent uh, flu viruses, those are highly virulent. They don't have pandemic potential yet because they aren't readily transmissible in people. They do exist in nature and in uh, zoonotic infections of people, and we do that at a lower biosafety level, as we should probably. Um, smallpox is the most highly regulated pathogen at the moment, uh, at least prior to this funding pause. Only two labs in the world are allowed to use it, and the experiments that they're allowed to do are highly restricted and go through extensive committee approvals. That's because it combines high virulence and high transmissibility, pandemic potential, um, and doesn't anymore exist in nature. And so, uh, although there's some immunity from prior vaccination and a few uh, natural cases, basically the world is relatively naive to smallpox. And that's why it receives such high containment. The work that uh, of creating transmissible virulent uh, uh, flu viruses is like smallpox in those three ways, but is done at a level of biosafety intermediate between H between natural characterization of uh, natural isolates of flu and, uh, and the work on, uh, say, Ebola or other filoviruses. So I said accidents happen, and there's a long list of them uh, that are, that I'm starting with the, the sort of most notorious and severe. The outbreak, uh, large outbreak of foot and mouth disease that occurred in the UK uh, in the last the previous decade was an escape from the Perbright Biosafety Level 3 Agricultural Lab. There was a, a release of uh, SARS from a lab in Beijing in 2004, so after the epidemic was over, uh, the natural epidemic was over, um, and that was from a Biosafety Level 3 lab, and there were seven secondary infections before, uh, before it was controlled. And most people who have studied it think that the 1977 reemergence of H1N1 flu which had not been present in humans uh, since 1957, uh, when, when a new strain of flu replaced the currently circulating H1N1. So it then reemerged in 1977, and the sequence looked like about a 1953 or 48, something mid-1950s-ish isolate. So the conclusion was that that isolate had been genetically frozen, therefore must have been physically frozen, and there are sort of two hypotheses. One is it was in the permafrost in some, somebody's dead body, uh, which is not impossible. Or the other is that it was in a laboratory freezer in probably China or Russia. And uh, as they were trying to make, uh, do experimental work on it, they, it was released and 
became the circulating strain until 2009. So we had 22 years of global spread of that virus, probably from a lab accident. If you look at, accident, at accidental infections that don't result in uh, onward transmission, there are a bunch more. Uh, and this is a list of them. I won't go through all of them. My favorite is, uh, because it illustrates human error, is the person who thought they were doing a West Nile experiment in 2003 in Singapore and found out that their vial was contaminated with the SARS virus. Uh, unrelated to West Nile, and was uh, was infected by that SARS virus. So this is a little bit busy slide, but if you take those anecdotes and the other anecdotes, and you actually keep track of them carefully, um, as the CDC does, in a paper uh, published in in uh, 2012, over the period 2004 to 2010. There were at least four laboratory-associated infections in biosafety level three in the United States with select agents, and that reflects something less than 2,000 years, lab years of work, and it's not an exact number because the way the figures are reported, you can't isolate only the biosafety level three lab years, although you can isolate the biosafety level three isolates. So this is a, an optimistic estimate that 0.2% uh, risk occurs of a laboratory associated infection per lab year in BSL-3. Uh, a similar estimate that's a bit higher comes from intramural labs at the NIH uh, where, they were, where they measure it by worker years instead of uh, lab years and it's about 1% per full-time worker year. So if someone was in the BSL-3 2,000 hours the whole year, uh, <coughs> the the figures come out to about 1% risk that they get infected. So those are small, but, uh, and perhaps acceptable if you, if you think the work is important enough, um, and if the risk is to that person. But if we're thinking about a pandemic context, then the risk really has to be inflated to, a, to allow for the potential consequences. So it's not just the probability of an infection, uh, but it's multiplying that probability times the consequence of a pandemic should, should that infection occur and lead to a pandemic. So it's a sort of multi-step process. So if you break that down and the probability of a, uh, you, you need the probability of a pandemic from one unit of research, which we'll call a laboratory year of research, um, uh, and then you need the probability that if there's a, pro uh, a laboratory associated infection, this is a conditional probability, probability that a pandemic results. And we've estimated that from, from Henkel et al. You get a bigger number if you use the NIAID estimates. Um, several groups, including ours, have estimated the probability that if you have a single introduction of a virus with a flu-like uh, uh, reproductive number, epidemiological properties, that it will uh, spread widely. And for something like H5N1, where there's no human immunity, if it's transmissible, it would be expected to spread widely with reasonably high probability, not 100% probability because uh, it might just fizzle out. Uh, it might just be that the first person infected uh, doesn't happen to infect others or is effectively quarantined or whatever. Um, the the estimates that, uh, that I did and that, my, that Jamie Lloyd Smith did don't take into account those sort of quarantining and countermeasures. A more recent uh, estimate from a group uh, in Europe suggests including, uh, which includes those countermeasures, suggests uh, that it's around 10 or 20 percent probability that a single laboratory infection would result in uh, extensive global spread. So, if you multiply those together, you get something like a one in 10,000 to one in 1,000 uh, risk per BSL-3 lab year of gain of function work on flu. So that's the probability side. And those numbers should be adjusted. I'm proposing those as straw men that people should encounter and argue with and, and, uh, and modify. So control measure, measures should help, which are factored into only the, the final estimate. Vaccination and prophylaxis of lab workers should help. 
if they're known to be exposed. Um, the enhancement to BSL-3+, plus, which uh, is somewhere intermediate between BSL-3 and BSL-4, could help. And there are cool molecular strategies of putting in microRNA tags, targets uh, for microRNAs that are human specific, not targeted by the ferrets, uh, which can sort of disable the virus in humans while leaving it pathogenic in ferrets. Uh, some people have embraced those enthusiastically. Others, have, others, gain of function PIs, have argued that that would undermine their experiments. Um, <clears throat> Reasons to increase the estimate is essentially that the U.S. probably has one of the better safety records um, and that the U.S. is, the safety record as published is not very complete, um, which might mean that we don't have as good a safety record as we think. Um, but in any case, there is global uh, possibilities of these accidents. <laughs> so then the consequence side is the probability, the attack rate in a pandemic, if you get one, uh, or also meaning the, the number of people infected, times the risk that they die, times the global population. Um, using the last four pandemics, uh, several publications have suggested that the pandemic attack rate is somewhere between a quarter and a third um, in, in each of those last four pandemics. Uh, Case fatality risk, of course, is unknowable for a strain that hasn't been invented yet. At the moment, uh, there's, there's debate about it, but I think the strong evidence is that wild type H5N1 bird flu is really 60% lethal if you get it. It's not that there are a bunch of mild cases that are being missed. People have looked and not found such cases. Um, it could go down. Uh, it seems to have gone down uh, in the strains that were modified in the, in the uh, Gain of function experiments, so maybe 60%, hopefully 60% would not be maintained, um, uh, but we don't know. And then the global population, I think, is the one number we can all agree on roughly. Um, so when you multiply those three numbers together, the consequence of a pandemic with a really virulent strain is 2 million to uh, 1.4 billion fatalities. That's a big number, <laughs> um, to say the least. To put it in context, 1% is half of the 1918 strain and about, uh, about 100 times that of the 2009 pandemic. Um, so, so this is not a typical pandemic. Most pandemics we experience in our lifetimes, of which we'll probably experience a few more, uh, should not be at this level, but using the, the data we have available on the, on the um, strain, we have to consider scenarios that are perhaps worse than, than what will, will occur. So that's the, that's the other piece of the equation, and that also could be, could be uh, modified, so the virulence could be reduced. Um, on the other hand, there will be a lot of, if there is a laboratory accidents, a laboratory accident that leads to a pandemic, we're all in big trouble as scientists. Our credibility is badly harmed. Uh, schools will be closed. All sorts of things will happen that are, that are not counted in those mortality costs. So if you multiply those probability times the consequence, <clears throat> as people do for other dangerous activities that, that have a small risk of a bad consequence, like nuclear energy, or, um, or uh, in fact, other, some other kinds of scientific experiments like the building of the Large Hadron Collider. People have made s estimates like this. You can get an expected value. So that expect expected value is uh, a little hard to think about for, for people who don't think about these things. It's probably nothing bad will happen. Small probability something very bad will happen. And one way to combine those probabilities is just to multiply the probability by the consequence. And you get somewhere between 2,000 and a million plus fatalities per year of experimentation. So again, don't, don't take these numbers at face value if you don't want to, find other ones. The, the reason I go through them in rather excruciating detail is that none, none of the consideration up to this time has used any numbers. 
risk assessment in this context has been a bunch of people sitting in a room and saying, yeah, I think that lab's pretty safe. And that's not acceptable when you have uh, these kinds of numbers available and on their face they look, look uh, unusually bad. So I don't, I'm not wedded to any of these numbers. Pick your own uh, well-supported numbers. But if these numbers are within a factor of a thousand of being right, then we should think really hard. I mean, say they're, say they're a thousand-fold overstated and it's actually two fatalities per BSL-3 lab year. We would not be happy running a BSL-3 lab that we thought was going to kill two people for in the same year. Right, that would not be a kind of trade-off we would take in, uh, happily in society <clears throat> or as the director of a BSL-3 lab. So these are presented for you to think about and to challenge. Um, it's worth noting that this work is happening in at least six countries. Um, there is global variation in lab standards and in the enforcement of those standards. And uh, I think what we do in the consideration during this funding pause uh, will be watched very closely by other countries. So, in thinking about these experiments, it's, it raises ethical questions because people's lives are being put at risk. There is a benefit that's seen as a, as a reason to put those lives at risk. And we need some principle on which to weigh those. And again, I'm not going to try to convince you this is the best way to weigh them, but I think it's one, one way to weigh them uh, that, uh, that's worthy of some thought. As all of you who have done human subjects training know, the probably most influential document in bioethics is the Nuremberg Code. It does not apply to these gain-of-function experiments. It is, it is about experiments on identified human subjects. It says if you're going to put human life at risk in an experiment to, say, test the efficacy of a drug or a vaccine, it should satisfy certain criteria, two of which I've listed here. It should be, the experiment should be such as to yield fruitful results for the good of society, unprocurable by other approaches, and that the humanitarian importance of the problem to be solved uh, should be enough to justify the risk. So it says if you're going to put you and you and you at risk by being subjects in my clinic. If I'm going to put you at risk because you're subjects in my clinical trial, it better be the case that I've thought of all the other alternatives and concluded there's not one to get the same benefit and that the benefit is big enough to justify the risk. So, as I said, that's, that code does not apply to this, but I think it suggests that we share some, some moral intuitions about what it's okay to do and what it's not okay to do to put people at risk. And I would say that putting people at risk who are not even aware that they're being put at risk entails at least some of the same obligations. A remarkable statement that I only learned about about maybe a year and a half ago, but all of our leading scientific bodies have signed up to is this statement. Scientists have an obligation to do no harm, and they should always take into consideration the reasonably foreseeable consequences of their own activities. <clears throat> Doing no harm is actually a really high bar, and I, I'm not sure I agree with that. I'm not sure, I mean, we do harm every time we get on a plane to go to a conference, but we, we uh, you know, no harm is a very, very high bar. But nonetheless, that is the, uh, that is the statement that our academies of science have signed up to. Um, and I think it's worth at least considering. When thinking about the ethics of this, I think the, the response on the other side, uh, which is an understandable one, is how can you stop good science from going on? You should not be censoring or prohibiting any science because all science is valuable. And that has a certain plausibility until you serve on a study section or even worse, submit something to a study section and get it back with the 11th percentile. Most good science that could yield benefits for society is not done. It's not done mostly because we don't have the money to do it, uh, or we don't believe that our society has the money to do it, or because the reviewers believe the benefits are too small, or that there are better ways to do the science that the uh, reviewer thought of and you didn't. <clears throat> 
We don't do certain science because IRBs prohibit it. We don't do experiments to figure out people's cold tolerance by immersing them in, in ice water the way uh, was done in the past because that's considered bad, uh, unethical, and un unallowable. We don't do certain experiments on animals that would be interesting to learn from because the harm to the animals is too great. And we don't do, for example, smallpox experiments that might be interesting, some smallpox experiments, because the risk uh, of biosafety is too great. So this is not a, this funding pause, which by the way, applies to 20, uh, roughly two dozen projects in the four or so billion dollar NIAID budget. It applies to 24 projects or so. Um, this is not a sort of chop at the heart of science. This is a reprioritizing and saying this kind of science is too risky, at least for the moment, and we need to think about it before we do it. So what about the benefits? Obviously, this work is being done by people who believe for, for in some cases, good reasons that it's beneficial for the progress of science and also for public health. And I think there's some merit in that, and I, I would agree that there are some benefits. I think most of those benefits can be achieved by other means uh, that, that do not involve creating these potential pandemic pathogens, and that'll be my last section. But I want to talk about the benefits because I think, again, we all do the work we do because we see benefits, and we all uh, justify it in terms of uh, of what it can do for society, not only for pure knowledge. Arguably the first uh, gain-of-function experiment uh, in current terms was this experiment in 2005 where a group at CDC and NIH and elsewhere reconstructed the 1918 pandemic flu virus. There was uh, a lot of discussion about whether that was a good idea. There was some discussion about whether that was a good idea. Uh, none of it quantitative, as far as I'm aware. Um, and the, the paper was published, and they analyzed the reasons why it was so virulent, and the sequence of it, and all sorts of other things. And then, uh, about a year ago, the, the authors of this paper published an article describing all the public health things, benefits that could not have been possible without this. I don't think any of those are true. It's not that the, this was not useful. It's that there are lots of public health benefits that we got from our general knowledge of H1N1 flu. None of them required making the virus. We didn't get any new antivirals or vaccines based on this work. In the 2009 pandemic, for example, there was, uh, there was a question about whether people who were old enough to have seen this virus uh, would be protected by their antibodies against the then, the then new 2009 virus. And that was an important hypothesis to test. It was tested, the answer was yes. And that's claimed as a, as a success for reconstructing this virus. It's not, it's a success for thinking about this virus. You didn't even need the sequence for that. You could use the sequence for other things, but the, the, there has been a tendency, I would argue, among the proponents of this kind of work to overstate the benefits and especially the essential benefits, the, things to, the, the benefits for which their work, the gain of function work is essential. Um, and so I think that's a worthwhile thing to think about in evaluating other claims of benefits. The largest benefit that's been claimed recently uh, for the recent gain of function experiments is that if we know what to look for out there when we do, bird, when we do surveillance of flu in birds, we can uh, cull the birds that have dangerous looking viruses, we can prepare vaccine stocks uh, against pre-pandemic pre vaccine stocks, so these are strains that aren't infecting any people or are only infecting a handful of people, but might someday become pandemic and we can stockpile vaccines as we do right now for H5N1. The US has about 100 million or so doses of H5N1 vaccine, even though there are no cases of that vaccine, that virus in the United States. So it's a reasonable idea that we would use our surveillance, uh, use what we learn about transmissibility to prioritize uh, um, viruses for such, such uh, countermeasures. The problem with that is that in the last 
five years, there were about 1,600 outbreaks of flocks that were infected with highly pathogenic avian flu. And there were about 1,600 sequences of one virus or one part of a virus deposited in each of two databases, some of them overlapping, but, but let's call it two, two sequences per flock that was known in the world to have these. So we are not getting a comprehensive picture of flu virus given that each flock has many birds, each bird has many virus sequences, um, and that, uh, that we're getting two per flock on average. And it's taking roughly almost a year before the general public gets to see these sequences. Now, the people in WHO get to see it sooner than that, but uh, this is not a sort of high speed endeavor of find the virus, take an action, analyze it, take an action. We can't do that. We don't have that kind of surveillance in place. I think maybe the most telling example though is what we've done in response to H7N9, which some of you will remember, uh, most of you will remember uh, is a strain of virus, flu virus that has been problematic the last two winters uh, zoonotically infecting humans in China and in a few other places. Um, <clears throat> without any gain of function data, without any knowing of the sequences in the gain of function experiments, we know that H7N9 is as concerning as any virus could be before it becomes pandemic. There have been four documented, pretty well documented cases of human to human transmission. If you look at the uh, sequence and at the phenotypes of the vi viruses isolated from the people, not the ducks, but the people uh, who get it from the, from the animals, <laughs> those viruses show human receptor binding phenotypes, which is one of the most important phenotypes for transmission. And if you put those viruses from people into guinea pigs or ferrets, they transmit. So they've, they've gained ferret transmission, which argues, by the way, that ferret transmission and easy human-to-human -human transmission are maybe not the same thing. Um, but all those danger signs, none of which required gain-of-function studies, should have said, this is a high-priority virus. And if there were actions to be triggered, the, those should have been triggered by these danger signs. Despite that, we have allowed zoonotic transmission to continue. We let the, let the bird markets, had the bird markets close briefly in China. Um, and more cases, this is a year old slide, but the, still true. The last winter there were more cases and there are more cases expected this winter. So I don't think it's the case that when the world sees a high risk flu virus, we drop everything and prioritize <laughs> countermeasures. We do, we go about our business um, to a large extent. Um, the other argument that's been made more in the past and now seems to be resurfacing is that we need to know this for vaccine design. We can design better vaccines if we know what makes a flu virus transmissible. I find that not totally implausible because more science is, scientific knowledge is probably helpful, but we don't know the molecular basis of transmissibility in any pathogen. And we have about three dozen good vaccines that work pretty well. We have a flu vaccine that doesn't work very well. Um, but, but none of those do we know, you know, Jenner didn't know the, the DNA sequence of uh, smallpox and did a pretty good job. And in fact, uh, what you look for is things that are highly antigenic, things that are safe, um, and not particularly things that are transmissible. And that's not just my view, the former head of Merck Vaccines has, has made the same point in a letter to science. I think the most interesting question scientifically, and actually the subject of a meeting that I'm gonna to try to organize uh, if enough flu virologists are speaking to me in a few weeks, few months, um, is, is that transmission is a complicated phenotype. And we, we wrote a piece that just came out in eLife a couple of weeks ago uh, to try to make this point. So decisions about what we should do depend on our level of overall concern about a particular virus. So this is about pandemic risk assessment. If you see a virus, is it a bad one that we should worry about or just one of the many that we shouldn't? And that level of concern 
depends on its transmissibility and the severity of infection. And those in turn, which are kind of high level uh, epidemiologic phenotypes, depend on a bunch of biological traits, the pH and temperature tolerance, virus morphology, whether it binds human or bird receptors, whether it's stable at the right temperatures, whether it's drug resistant, et cetera. And those depend on the sequence in ways that are really very poorly understood uh, at the moment. We know some mutations in the sequence that seem to be associated with certain phenotypes, but that is not 100% association. Um, and when you, uh, when you take some of the most famous mutations that are supposed to do have a certain phenotype, you can find a counterexample. For example, this is the, a favorite of many virologists um, as a, a mutation in the, the basic polymerase subunit. <clears throat> and it's because in many backgrounds, it increases the virulence and transmissibility of the, uh, of the virus. The very group that started this whole uh, controversy, the Fouchier group in, in the Netherlands, published a paper saying that in the pandemic strain, where it was identified that they had this mutation some, in some strains uh, and people worried about it, they showed that, uh, in fact, it changed neither virulence nor transmissibility. There are a lot of other examples. And we should try to understand this better. And there are certainly many uh, important scientific questions. But uh, the idea that we have an immediate application, I think, is an exaggeration. Um, so this is kind of a flow chart of the, the potential benefits uh, as people have, have suggested them. And I think I'll skip it because it takes a long time. But, but essentially, this epistatic this problem of epistasis and uncertain genotype phenotype mapping uh, is sort of at the root of all, the, all of the issues with claiming benefits. And then there are some more specific benefit, uh, so some more specific concerns that I've mentioned uh, about the other two benefits, about those two benefits that are, that are claimed. So the last thing I want to talk about is alternatives. And the basic argument I want to make is that there are more mechanistic approaches and safe ones to understanding how flu adapts and transmits in humans, and that these can better serve the public health goals of defeating flu. And then secondly, that we don't have to understand our enemy to defeat it, right? The army is not full of anthropologists. There are a few, but it's not, we, don't, we don't have to understand our enemy to defeat it. If we can make a good vaccine and do it fast, then doesn't really matter how flu transmits if we can do something uh, to stop it. Um, so developing better measures to prevent and treat it uh, is possible even if we give up on the science of transmission, as interesting as it is. So I think the wrong way to think about the, the gain of function question is, should we do this work or not? Because there are benefits to doing the work. And if the choice is just not doing it and not doing anything else, then, then it's a hard question uh, what we should do. But that's not actually the alternative. The real, we have a budget for the National Institutes of Health and for others who, who uh, are concerned about this, CDC and others. And we can spend money on one thing or we can spend money on other things. And I would argue, and we make this claims much more extensively in the published paper, so I won't belabor it. I would argue that the only category that has high risk to life, only category of experiments, are the two dozen or so projects that create potential pandemic pathogens. Those are also relatively low throughput and relatively ungeneralizable in the sense that <clears throat> only a very small number of virus strains can be identified. Um, the sample sizes of ferrets are in the range from two to eight. So the statistics are uh, unsupported, I would say, um, in, in most of these experiments. Alternatives including wor include working with pieces of the virus or defective viruses in vitro, which by definition can't infect anyone. They have higher throughput because they're cheaper. We can look at natural bird and compare them to, to human strains and try to see from their sequences what's happened. So use the experiments that have been done in nature. And then we can do other things that are not about learning how flu transmits, but are very useful, like developing a universal vaccine, <clears throat> which could be used to treat, to, to prevent a, a wide variety of strains, uh, 
uh, not just the not just the bad ones. Um, we can work on the technological aspects of accelerating vaccine production, um, which has been done, uh, for example, by Novartis. Uh, a few uh, about a year ago, they published a, a paper showing the, the creation of a vaccine seed stock in five days once they had a sequence. Um, we can work on host-targeted therapeutics, all sorts of other things that are not about understanding the virus, but about killing it. So how should we think about these alternatives? This is a cartoon version of how I think we should think about it. Essentially, we have a portfolio of things that we do to try to stop flu, and we should make that portfolio large, uh, and we, we do to some extent, it should probably be larger. Um, and on one hand, we can consider a portfolio that has gain of function and other work on flu biology and other work that's not flu biology but is toward the same goal. And we should compare that against the same money spent on alternative approaches to flu biology, alter alternative uh, mechanisms that are not flu biology and not gain of function, but taking into account the opportunity costs that these relatively expensive gain of function experiments have. We should weigh those benefits and <clears throat> say and ask whether expanding these other things could get some of the many of the same benefits as gain of function, at least in the public health arena. It would not get exactly the same scientific results. And we should ask which of these we favor. And on the side favoring alternatives, we should place the risk of gain of function, which if it's anything like what I described is a very heavy weight. On the other side, we could put the risks to, of the alternative approaches, but those risks number in the very, very small to zero range. So it's, uh, so there's not much weight on that side. Um, I think when you do that, if you believe actually either the risk or the benefit part of what I said, you might end up uh, favoring the use of alternatives instead of gain of function. If you believe both, uh, then you, I think, really have to favor the alternatives. Uh, and if you believe neither, then, then you should conclude uh, uh, that we really should continue gain of function. This is a public discussion. It will be had over the next uh, year. There will be meetings at the National Academy, meetings at the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. Um, they will be soliciting public input. Uh, they will be getting a lot of input from those who have a very strong interest in the continuation of the work that they are funded to do. Um, and so I hope that some people will find it uh, attractive to participate in that discussion because I think it's really fundamental to what we do in public health and how we think about the uh, responsibility of scientists um, to do work that is harm helpful um, and reduce the risks as much as we can. So rather than reading conclusion slides, I think I'll stop there and ask for discussion. <laughs>